everybody. We're on today with Dr. Jeff Mirosky, and he's the Chief Medical Director for Sil Silver Summit Health Plan here in Nevada. His job is to provide a physician's voice for all the members of the health plan. His responsibility to advise the health plan to make sure the business decisions are coming from a medical perspective. He was also formerly the Chief uh, Medical Officer for Sunrise Hospital in Las Vegas, has an extensive background in veteran medical affairs. He's board certified, the Vice Chair of the Nevada Board of Health, and still a practicing physician at Southern uh, Nevada VA Medical. So, Dr. Murawski, welcome. Thank you. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Um, I'm Brian. I am the uh, lead broker for Protect Health. My partner, Rob Morgan, who is uh, the second broker in charge and the uh, group services manager here. And uh, we're, we're really happy to have Dr. Murawski on because he, I think he's going to have answers to a lot of questions. Uh, that everybody out there has been asking about COVID. So um, with that, um, I would like to get started and just open up. We're going to do several different topics of questions, and uh, we will go through uh, different questions and get his uh, position on them and uh, maybe expand on them if we have it and uh, go from there. So uh, Dr. Mareski, the first question is about the uh, general vaccine questions. We know vaccines have begun to go up a little bit, which is great, especially in some of the really bad states like Nevada, unfortunately. But overall, the vaccines are still down uh, considerably. Yeah. Why? Do you, wh why are they down, do you, you think? Know, you know, it, it's, a, it's an interesting question. And a lot of people have a lot of different takes. The way I typically look at it is in anything that we have, there's always an adoption curve. There's always early adopters, late adopters, people who are never gonna change. Think about the iPhone, right? You know, there are people that waited in line right when they came out. There are people that wanted to wait a little while and there are people who are never gonna have one and still have a flip phone. Sure. Any new intervention has that. Um, what you wanna do is try to move people in this case because of health as far forward as we can. And the innovators in this case are the people that signed up and participated in clinical trials that were really early with the vaccine to help us understand it. And we did a lot of those really fast. Yes. Um, you know, vaccine speed and how fast you put out a vaccine is really a function of one thing, how much money you're willing to spend doing it. <laughs> and we spent an awful we lot did. of money to do that. So you get a fast vaccine. Now, so that adds to a little bit of this. And so there's two groups that are left who haven't adopted it already. It's about half of our population in Nevada, a little less than half. Um, vaccine hesitant people, and um, I call vaccine lazy people. <laughs> um, vaccine lazy is I just can't get to it. It's hard to get there. It's difficult to schedule. So, um, I just, well, I, you know, they're not, they don't have a reason they don't want to do it. They're not concerned. They just haven't gotten around to it because they may not see the time sensitive nature of why you want to get vaccinated. Those so are probably those, the people we're seeing. Sorry not to interrupt, but those are probably yeah. the people we're seeing, the group I presume you would think the group we're seeing right now that are rushing to get the vaccine because yeah, of what's again, happening? I think part of that's on us to make it easier to get the Agreed. vaccine, Agreed. right? When it was all appointment only, right? That's tough for some people. Sure. So you need yeah. to have walk-ins. When you don't have access to public transportation or you think public transportation is risky in and of itself, well, we need to get the vaccine actually in your community. And so there's been a bunch of bus related vaccine events right in the middle of communities, for people who may not have personal vehicles um, yeah. to get the vaccine there. So that's that kind of is not lazy is not a pejorative word, but it's 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 vaccine hard to get to. Vaccine, sure. I'm not thinking about it. It's not an active vaccine. I'm concerned. group. Gotcha. Um, and I know Rob and I can attest to that when we were pre-qualified for the vaccine as a uh, because we work with Medicare people, mm -hmm. uh, we had, it was not easy getting in to get the vaccine. Waited, uh, no. Rob waited in hours in line sometimes, but one time to be turned away. So yeah. believe me, we, a, we know how that went. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. That was a and, fun afternoon. It was, I'm sure. Yeah. And, and you know, I, I had to wait hours to get my vaccine sure. early on as a healthcare provider. And, you know, luckily I could do it while I was working. And so we just did it, but now, yeah. you know, and that's, and that's just what happens. And so, it, yeah, it's. I was just gonna say, it sounds like that's what we need. Because my, my next question was, what can be done to increase the awareness? And it sounds like you you do, you actually answered that question. We just need to do more events and get it, it more into the communities, yep. the uh, yes. underserved populations, which right. I know is a problem here. Right. So places where we don't see a lot of vaccine, we have data by zip code. We know where it's a little less. Get right. some vaccines in those communities. Now that that takes care of the people where they don't have a desire not to get it, or they're not they're not afraid, they're not hesitant. Sure. 
The so other group we have to work on are vaccine hesitant people. And and that's another, you know, large group of who's remaining that we want to convince as many of those folks to help get over their hesitancy. And the hesitancy can be lots of reasons. Yes. Um, one reason for hesitancy can be, unfortunately, they've consumed a lot of misinformation. Or at this point, my personal view is there's some disinformation out there, yes. which is actively trying to be untrue. Um, you know, there are no tracking devices in the vaccine. We already have them. There are cell phones. If right. the government wanted to know where I was, it would not be doing through a vaccine. Right. They already have it because I have a cell phone. They know where I am. Yep. Okay. Um, there's also a lot of misinformation and disinformation about the side effects and rates of side effects. You know, people pull all this data. Oh, my goodness. There's thousands and thousands of reports of people who got X or Y or Z right. with the vaccine. Right. And the story I always tell this one that we use in medical schools all the time, and I think it's a lot of fun, is did you know in the 1970s that we believed coffee caused lung cancer? And people went, what? Coffee I do doesn't not know lung that. Cancer? No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. But people who smoked drank more coffee and so high coffee consumption was linked to smoking and smoking causes lung cancer i know i meant i meant that i did not know we thought that (laughs) we did yeah yeah so 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 this is one of those things with the covid vaccine is that you know one in ten thousand people every day gets heart palpitations well then that means that one in ten thousand people every day who gets a covid vaccine should say they got a heart palpitation yes Causality versus relationship are very different things. Absolutely. And so misinformation is people packaging up this relationship and saying it's causality when it's not. Um, The second thing for hesitancy we have to work on is the risk of these effects, even when there may be real ones. And the best example I'll give is teenage boys can get some swelling on their heart, myocarditis, (laughs) which related to the vaccine. We know that it is. Mm -hmm. But the chance of getting that is one twentieth the chance of that same kid dying from COVID. Right. So yes, it's a side effect, but your chance of dying from COVID is much, much higher. So we pick the vaccine. It's putting that information in the right way so people can consume it. So for part of vaccine hesitancy, it's translating these really complex scientific messages Mm-hmm. Not just into because I say so because I'm a doctor and I went to med school and you have to believe me, which is really nice and I wish you would, but but also translating in a way where everybody understands, oh, I see. So it's causality and relationship and that's where it goes and what's my risk of having this anyway, you know, and some things are side effects. People go, oh, well, all these people got achy and had fevers. I'm like, well, that's yeah. not a side effect. That's actually proof the vaccine's working. Exactly. exactly. So let's take that as a positive. Everyone that had one of those, I'm glad you did. Because yes. now I know your vaccine works. And and um, I went through it, and I was happy as hell to have those six hours of hell. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just to know that it was working, and that it was yeah. you know it, even though I've had COVID twice now, it was working. So. <laughs> yeah. And and so you know that's what we want to do to help get that number up because if we continue to limit the pool of people who can get COVID then you eventually put it out. It's no different than what the Forestry Service does when they thin out areas of dry brush to reduce fire risk. The more people who are basically COVID shielded, the less COVID can spread, and then it turns off and it goes away and it becomes something minimal. Well, that's a perfect segue into my next part of that is that that is the message we've always put across. And one of the uh, vaccine, one of the arguments we hear from the vaccine hesitant is, yeah, but we don't know what the long-term effects are going to be. And from what everything I've read, and I'm, that's why I wanted to get your input on this, from what I've read and from what I've listened to and the doctors I've talked to, yourself included, uh, that generally speaking, after the first two weeks, we, we know all the side effects this vaccine is going to cause because vaccines typically aren't in your body long enough to cause long-term effects. Yeah, and, and I think that's a really great question. And I, and I, I get it a lot too, right? Oh, we don't know the long-term effects. Well, in vaccine science, because of the way a vaccine works, it goes in, your body recognizes it, and it's gone. Right. So vaccine side effects are kind of short-term. They're from the vaccination itself, like local, muscular, um, mm-hmm. and then reactions to that, that immune response that you get. And if that goes awry, then that's what we call a vaccine side effect. There's some immune response that doesn't do what we want it to do. But there's no long-term vaccine that's had like, oh my goodness, six years after we got it, somebody got X or Y or Z and that right. was related to it. And, and we it's, know vaccines can't, um, 
cause change your DNA. <laughs> right. That's another one we yeah. hear too. You know, it, it, it's a great one, right? You know, because we say, oh, these are mRNA vaccines. Well, right. you know, okay, mRNA is just a series of proteins in a string. They're nucleic acids. We put them in a string. It's basically like a sign to your body. It's a language that it reads. It can also read protein language. And protein language comes from nucleic acid language. And so we just put this piece in. I mean, if you eat meat, you get nucleic acids because it has DNA in it too. Right. Right. I mean, vegetables. Everything has DNA. You. Oh my goodness! You just ingested DNA. That. That's. That. I know. I understand the concern. It's not any different than the vaccines we had before that were these protein-based vaccines. And in some ways, they're actually going to be a lot nicer because instead of having that intermediate step of, well, I'm going to put a protein in that your body is then going to have to recognize and turn into a nucleic sequence that then has to create immune response, I just took out the middle guy and I'm going direct, which is, it just makes it work much more effectively. And yeah. we'd have probably seen a lot more mRNA vaccines about five or seven years ago when the technology had been around for five or seven years already, so it's about 10 years old, um, except it's all new equipment to make the vaccines. And right. that's a lot right. of capital yes. to have to lay out to make that conversion. And no pharmaceutical company gets a lot of money. They don't make money off vaccines. No, I, So how do, you, yeah. how do you make that switch? Well, you fund them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I've, uh, I've been doing, I've been following the mRNA vaccines for some time because I'm one of those people that was told never to get a flu shot due to my family's uh, high potential to get mm -hmm. Guillain-Barre. My father died of it. Right. Um, I've had other family members that have had it, so we've been told never to get a the, whatever type of flu shot it is. That yeah, type. that's that's the protein. That's a protein derived influenza shot. So it's taking a piece of the virus, making right. a protein, and then having an injection. The mRNA vaccines get rid of all of that. Right. Which is so why I was so happy to be able to with, get yeah, it. So, yeah. All your folks with egg vaccines, other kind of allergies, they can't take vaccines. Sure. mRNA vaccines are going to be all for them. The only side effect we're saying right now for mRNA vaccines is if you've had a history of anaphylaxis to any vaccination, sure. meaning anaphylaxis is you stop breathing, your heart stops. Right. I mean, that's what we're talking right? It's not something you forget. Um, it, you don't, <laughs> um, you'll know you had it and you have to have had it. And then we say, don't get a vaccine. And we're not saying that just for the COVID vaccine. Uh, yeah. We say that for vaccine. every vaccine. Correct me if I'm wrong though, the, the vaccine, the, what causes those anaphylactic conditions uh, isn't the vaccine itself, but no. the delivery system, correct? Yeah. The purple yep. glycol. It's all the delivery the, system. Okay. Yep. It's all the, so until we can build a different delivery system, mm. we're stuck saying no. Gotcha. Some things are shared. Sure, sure. Okay. Unfortunate. Well, that's that's the great answer to that, and and that's very helpful because that's one of the, you know, that's the other question we get of, you know, I've been told I shouldn't get vaccines or whatever, and right. uh, this kind of changes that, and I think mRNA yeah, so, vaccines so are here to stay. So yeah, so your Pfizer Modernas are perfectly fine. Great. You could say, hey, listen, the J and J is a protein-based adenovirus vector vaccine. I choose not to get that one. I get it. And what I tell people is, is there are those three choices in the U.S. right now. There are other choices available in Europe. Um, the J and J vaccine is really wonderful for people who need a one shot answer. Gotcha. Um, yeah. I talk about people who have mental health issues, people who have serious travel schedules and just can't get to a second sure. one. They're really good. One shot, fine. It's okay. Um, but uh, two shots are more are optimal if you can get them. Okay. I think also just for clarification for those that are going to be listening to this, watching this, and they're going to hear J and J, they may not be familiar oh. with that J and J. It's the Johnson and Johnson. There it vaccine. is. <laughs> yeah. So there's Pfizer and Moderna and the Johnson and Johnson vaccine. Correct. I shouldn't say J and J. It's but that's okay. That's okay. We know what you yeah. meant. We Doctor, know. Doctors <laughs> make everything you. shorter, and that's good because yeah. it leaves them more time to do the right thing. So we're all good with that. Um, great. Well, our next set of topics is um, myths about vaccines, and I think this is the. I think a lot of these we touched on a little bit, but a lot of this is what's causing that has that hesitancy um, and the mis and disinformation that's going on out there. So I I don't want to spend too much time on these just because I, I mean they are what they are, but I do want to clear up um, some of the you know the the vaccine rumors and myths that we're sure. hearing. Um, the first one is everybody is concerned with the fact of how fast these bro the, these vaccines were created and. Of course, our line to that, our answer to that is actually in reality, they're some of the most tested vaccines in human history, simply right. because we had a large enough section of people in the country that got sick and the amount of hours of testing that went in are, are far beyond even smallpox yeah. vaccine testing that we yeah. did. Yeah. 
Yeah, so, way better than polio. I mean, and we did national polio vaccine campaigns, right. you know, where they lined up people and made them take the polio vaccine. Um, you know, so I, I think, as I mentioned it before, right, vaccine development is technology and then cost to implement, which is your speed. And that's how much money you want to spend. Yeah. And when you've got an unlimited supply of money, you can go really fast. And when you have a national registry, like the internet's a wonderful thing, right? We haven't had this kind of equally accessible internet before. Right. And so it's not a pandemic for sure. Yeah. You could put an app on my phone and say, hey, Jeff, I'm going to check in with you on your vaccine for side effects, anything you may have felt, and gather all that information. Sure. So we can do something we never have been able to do before. Um, And across broader populations in a much quicker way. So everything was just on, you know, super speed in getting this done. And, you know, because you just move other priorities. And and so all the resources got put into it. So in reality, there were more hours put into this vaccine than any other in history. (laughs) I mean, that's great. Yeah. That is say, I, I remember hearing somewhere that there were, was more R&D research and development that were put into these vaccines in a, such a short amount of time uh, than any other vaccine in history. Yep. Yeah, I, I have friends that work for Pfizer and in their biotech development department, and they said basically everybody stopped doing everything else they were doing and just did this. Jumped on this. So yeah. instead of what we would have done before, which is a 10-person team with a 1,000 man hours a team, we had a 10,000 person team right. with 10 man hours or 100 man hours right. a, a person. Oh my goodness, you've got millions of man hours, millions of person hours of work. You get a lot farther. And the yeah. technology allows for much better coordination than when we were developing the flu vaccines. Even back in the um, in 2005, when we had the, um, the swine flu outbreak, yes. much yes. less than this, but it was a significant, um, illness among the elderly, you know, we didn't have this level of technology that allowed for the kind of coordination of research. Yes. You know, it was still like dial up a little bit. You know, and that was what, two and around. a half years before they had initial testing Yeah, on that. So, yep. Right. Scary, isn't it? <laughs> so the next myth, um, I do not want to spend much time on this one because I don't give it any credence, but it was one that my agents, more than one of my agents sent to me. Um, the myth is that medical centers, and you and your position are the perfect candidate to answer this, um, medical centers, clinics, testing centers, labs, are intentionally not reporting side effects to the vaccine in order to keep the campaign of vaccines going. Obviously, there's no truth to this, but do you have any idea where this rumor has started and why people are getting this information? You know, one of the the kind of things we heard about this one was that people had this thing like, oh, well, if you're pushing the vaccine and we find side effects, then that means you're wrong. And so you can't afford to be wrong, so you're not gonna push it out there. Which is exactly why they put the web-based app out directly to the people getting vaccinated and said, you tell us what you're feeling, we're gonna ping you and get that directly from you and take the clinic out of the good, of the run. Good, um, good, and so yeah. that was part of it, right? Was finding some equity by getting right to the front line. Um, the second was just this feeling that you know, medical science always under reports side effects for everything that we do. Sure. Um, that's actually not the case. We typically over report, um, listen to the warnings on any drug ad on TV and you'll find out that you could probably spontaneously combust from just about every drug you could ever take. Right, right. Um, you know, because they have these very long lists and that's because we over report everything. Right. Um, so I, I think it's that. And then, unfortunately, that's part of the disinformation campaign. Don't trust those people in the white coats. Right. And it doesn't um, help that we have a self-reporting sorry. system where the data that's on there is arbitrary at best, <laughs> anecdotal at worst, and people have access to that data in yeah. a raw form that does not tell the whole that's, picture. So it's, it's one of the things I always tell folks is that the VARES is not data. It's not yet data. It's right. just reports. Yeah. It's not data till someone does something to it exactly. and turns it into information because data is a series of ones and zeros. You can't make any sense of that. Right. Um, so someone has to go through that big VAERS database and then they have to say, okay, what's causality and what's relationship? Sure. Throw out the relationships, leave the causality. Now we have something to share with you. Exactly. And, and, and you know, so that, that, that's, that's kind of where it goes. And I understand that feels like we're hiding something. Yeah. Um, but it's just, you know, it's the statistics of looking at life yeah. um, of, of how we do things. It's, yeah. it's scary. I mean, it, and one of the things that is happening is based on what you just said, people 
are going in the hospital for a heart problem. They get tested COVID. They are positive, even though they're not there for COVID and COVID has nothing to do with their heart problem. Um, yeah. They die and, oh my God, that person had COVID or just got the vaccine mm -hmm. and had a heart problem and died. It's yeah. just, it, it's a huge amount of misinformation because of it that is. as well. It, so. it, it, and it's difficult to interpret, right? Just it like is. those deaths we talk about COVID caused and mm. COVID related deaths. Sure, yeah. Same idea and same thing here, right? Was that a, now, are we gonna report that side effect of the vaccine? Yeah, everybody that goes and gets admitted to the hospital after a single dose of the shot who still gets COVID, we still report that as the breakthrough sure, case, sure. even though we know you don't have full immunity until a couple of weeks after your second one. <laughs> you are segueing so well into my next topic. I, I, every time, I love how you're doing that. That is my next topic, is breakthrough cases. So here's, here's the question. Um, let me tell you, first of all, just full disclosure, I've had COVID twice now. Um, I had it back in November, December. It was god awful. Um, mm. Literally thought I was gonna die. But last two weeks ago, I went in to get an MRI and I got tested for COVID before I went. Uh, they made me do it, I didn't have a choice. Um, and then I went and got my MRI, everything was fine. And then three days later, I get a positive test back from Quest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Shocked the hell out of me because other than a stuffy nose and a little bit of a headache right. that I didn't even attribute to COVID, I didn't know. I've oh. since tested negative, thank goodness. Yep. Uh, but we are seeing break that segues me into yeah. the question is there are a lot of breakthrough cases coming in and it scared yeah. me that the fact that i was able to get it and even though i was mostly asymptomatic um right. we know the numbers are rare but we are seeing more and more each day oh. and we're seeing them in large groups yep. so my question is should people still generally feel safe knowing that they've had these fully vac full yeah. that they're fully vaccinated um yeah. even with Boy. i mean i know there's mask advice but that's a separate topic no, no. but should they still we'll feel safe <laughs> Yeah, let me, let me let me give you some numbers, and I think that's the best sure, way to look at. Please, um, if if we think about people who, and, and we have to say pre Delta variant and post Delta variant, because they're very different places for us. Yes. So, in a pre Delta variant world that does not exist anymore, there's different advice because basically there are different numbers. Yes, I would have felt perfectly safe. The world was wonderful. <laughs> Vaccines were great, and perfect, no issues. In a post Delta variant world, and now we're seeing Lambda variant cases in some parts of the US, which is another one um, similar to Delta. Um, what we're really seeing is that vaccination prevents serious illness and hospitalization about 4% less than it did before Lambda, Lambda and Delta variants existed. So your 98% vaccine efficacy is now 94% vaccine efficacy, gotcha. which means 6% of people are gonna get hospitalized with COVID, even if they've been vaccinated. And those people are, we're very specifically, we know who they are. Right. They are people with underlying serious medical conditions and the elderly. Yep. That's it. And serious medical conditions, I'm talking serious, like active treated cancer. Understood. People yep. with serious immune um, therapy, like transplant patients. That's the group we're talking about. So, major chronic conditions. Even more than major, like you can have uncontrolled diabetes or obesity or high blood mm -hmm. pressure. You're not that group. We're talking somebody who takes like immune suppressant agents for active rheumatoid arthritis and they take right. a bunch of them. Um, those are people that unfortunately now we're not protecting anymore because their risks are significant. Right. Um, the chances of not getting COVID at all of being 100% protective are somewhere in that 65% range. So what it means is that the vaccine will prevent you 65% of the time from getting COVID at all. But when it doesn't prevent it, what you've got is about a 40% chance of getting a cold. Yeah. And that's what you get is a little sniffly cold. And the it didn't problem, last long. It was only a few days. Last. It's five, five days usually yep. in and done. Yep. The problem is for those five days, you are sniffling and sneezing a little bit, and you are spreading COVID. That was my next, oh my gosh, you're good. That was my next question. Thank so, you for answering. So, so that's the <laughs> issue that gets into some of the guidance that's out around COVID. So what do I do? Well, I look at this and say, you know, and I'll give examples of me, and then there's my dad. My dad's on chemotherapy for cancer, sure. right? What do I do? I wear protection, I wear a mask um, to help me when I'm out in public in indoor spaces, right. and I limit my dining when I can't have a mask on, right? I just limit it. Think about the kind of places. And outdoors, it's a free for all. 
because the air is immensely diluted in the sky right. and we're not so worried about it. But so, indoors, I'm careful. In really, really crowded spaces, I try to avoid right now. Which, yeah, I've um, stopped going to my favorite. I, I'm a huge poker and blackjack player. And I've had yeah, to stop. it's hard. <laughs> it is. Right? So for, so. so for my dad, who's got cancer, I'm like, Dad, wear a mask. Do all of those things and don't go to a grocery store. I'll go shopping for you. Don't yeah. go any place. You don't have to go right. because of that risk to you is greater. So that's kind of where we're at. And so when we look at the hospitalizations, what's going on right now with the disease, this is a disease in terms of serious illness of the unvaccinated. Yes. So by vast numbers, I, as I've seen I, oh, reported. Huge, huge, huge. I mean, basically, if you look at the hospitals right now, you know, if, if you look at a major hospital in Las Vegas, and I won't say which one, but one of the big ones, um, if you look at the hundred or so patients, adults they have in the hospital with COVID right now, five of them who are sick with COVID aren't vaccinated. Yes. Hmm. And, and of those five, they've all got something really wrong with them. And I'm not yes. even sure that, like, if you have really bad heart failure or you get COVID, your heart failure is going to tip. And so two of them are heart failure and one's a, two of them have emphysema and, you know, bad dust storms tip them. And so they're in and one is really sick. Right. So it's 95 to five. It's a disease of the unvaccinated. Sure, sure. That is, that is exactly what uh, we're hearing. So I'm glad that uh, you, you were able to, you know, hit that home. That's what we needed. So um, the, the only other question I have on this, on the breakthrough case uh, question is, one of the other things that I'm being asked by clients is um, the breakthrough. Las Vegas is becoming a hotspot, and we know part of that is due to the lower vaccination numbers. However, when you compare our city to something like, um, I don't know, uh, Milwaukee, for example, we're very close sure. in numbers to Milwaukee, but they're seeing nothing like the surge we are here. Yeah. Do you think that the reason we see the surge more here than they are is because of the travel that comes in and out of our town? You know, we kind of looked at a little bit that data and I would have thought and it seemed to make sense to me that that would be a driver. But if we look at the vaccination rate among casino workers, our hospitality um, staffs, it's very, very high, much higher than the general population. They're in sure. the 70s. So if it were those people bringing it in and giving it to us, they have to have a vector, which is our employees to spread it. So it's so not spreading like in a hotel or in a casino to other right. Patrons? So it would have to be locals going into those areas, getting it and bringing That's it. That's what back. I meant. Yes. Okay. Which is possible. Okay. But more likely, what you look at is you look at the vaccination rates in the communities and the amount of suppression of community activity that still exists right so if you go to milwaukee and that's a great example because we're about the same size and i actually have really good friends over in milwaukee um they are still um relatively suppressed in what they do but what the milwaukee health department expects to see is a huge spike in COVID in about seven days Why? from today from now from now oh wow Why? because the Bucks won and everybody got out and crowded the streets and got together and had a big party. And so Las Vegas, because of our nature, you know, we relaxed fully. Oh, yes. When we came out of this. And I was guilty and of it myself. So. And everybody went back to restaurants and did everything and we did an indoor mask and we didn't do any of those things. And so we took an unvaccinated population and got rolling. Yeah. Uh, the example I'll give is Portland, Oregon, who was way hotter than us in the wintertime, um, but is way calmer than us now. Right. And one of the differences is, is that their um, relaxation was much slower in terms of coming out and demasking and sure. increasing capacity. It just, it just it just took longer for the community. Even after the, the city and the county and the state had relaxed the requirements, the community was just slower to get going. Gotcha. Where we went, boom. Um, which is very typical for Las Vegas, right? That's what we are. It, it is. I mean, you know, it's, it's tough because we're trying to get people back to work. Mm -hmm. We're in a hospitality-based city. Yeah. Um, I mean, what do you do? Uh, no. You know, I don't... It, 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 on on one hand, it's like, okay, are we putting profits over people? Uh, I mean, I don't think so. No, I don't. I don't think so. I don't think so either. I don't no, think. I mean, 
I think we have the means, we have the resources. We just need yeah. to encourage more people. Yeah, with vaccine. And we are we, we are did. seeing an increase. So thankfully, yeah. It is and and we didn't we didn't see enough kind of early vaccination. I think our biggest issue was you know we got rolling really fast and we didn't quite have the vaccination level that we needed to do it. So we were just a little early and got going, and so we got some spread. And then, you know, we really just needed to think about the fact that we needed to probably individually mask a little bit more. Yes. Um, when we were out and about, and that would have been a little more helpful. And so I think it was just some of that um, activity. The other thing that's very interesting is, you know, we had a very hot early summer which drove everybody inside. Very true. So, you know, one of the things that we look at and put this together is, unfortunately, we've got a community that can't really gather outdoors in the parks. Whereas, you know, in Milwaukee, good example, all my friends, they all had their gatherings of friends and other in, in really nice parks in Milwaukee. They have some beautiful ones. And it's 75 and sunny. Yeah. And even when it rains, it was 65 and nice. And, 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 and it, you're right. It's the exact opposite because when their winter comes, they congregate indoors. Mm-hmm. When ours right. comes, we're in the park. We go outside. So right. We go outside. That's a really which, good point. Which, which mitigates our curves a bit. When you look at our disease curves over time, we see things that look a little differently because we <laughs> have does, this yeah. indoor phenomenon of cramming everybody in the air conditions in your spaces. Gotcha. And um, that with the dry air and everything else and drying out the nasal passages, I'm sure that doesn't help. So. We just don't know, you know what the spread looks like. Yeah. So, you know, I, 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 there's only two things we can do, right, to mitigate spread, which is reduce capacity and mask and, mask, and then yeah. vaccinate. Uh, so, I'm sorry, doctor. Go ahead. Okay. No, so you just, no, no, no. So you just, you have to just make your picks. And I think the economics are very important of what we do. It's who we are. And so, you know, masking doesn't impact economics. <laughs> It doesn't masking doesn't prevent me from going out to dinner exactly. or spending my money or going to the casino or doing whatever. It does yep. not change any of that. And I've seen people, limitations have economic consequences, and you have to be very careful when you do that. And I've seen people eat, take the mask off, eat, and close the mask. So I mean, you know, if, if you're that worried, that's what you should be doing, or not going at all. So and not to backpedal the conversation at all, but I mean, you know, you hear with regards to myths, right? Uh, I've heard plenty of people talk about uh, the myths that the masks don't work anymore, the masks never worked. Um, can you just dispel that for us? <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, it's a great thought. And, and when we think about masking, really what we're doing is we're trying to stop the spread of the disease. And so this disease is spread, and this is the first myth I got to get to. It's spread by droplets. It's droplets that are relatively fat and juicy and full of neat little saliva or nasal secretions or whatever. Those droplets hold the virus, and then we spread them. Or we pick them up and we put them inside. So good things, right? All that hand washing we did before was fantastic for eliminating flu viruses. It reduced bacterial illness. It doesn't do squat for COVID. Right. Um, hand washing is not how it transmits. It's a nasal eye touching. Yeah, I was virus. interested by that data you and I talked about prior yeah. about the fact that there's not a con- single confirmed surface transmission case yeah, about exist. COVID. So right. the, the second part is people talk about, oh no no, this is an aerosol virus. So it goes in this fine mist that the masks don't work unless they're special N95s or hoods. The best data is, you're right, I can create a big glass box like the Chinese did back in 2020, and I can aerosolize this virus. I can also aerosolize any virus by doing that, and you can create an aerosol mist and make the virus spread. And you're right, for our healthcare workers who are doing certain procedures, we aerosolize the virus and we have to protect them differently in that situation. So when I go put a breathing tube in someone, I've got to be wearing different protection because I'm aerosolizing the virus. Out in the community, it's these big droplets. Cloth masks, any mask, basically blocks the those wet particles. They hit the mask. They don't go anywhere. Gotcha. I mean, if you sneeze really hard, you might blow it out to size. Maybe. And, and let's, let's, let's also point out here, because I don't think, I think there's still a ton of confusion about this, is that the mask isn't so much made to keep you from getting it, but from spreading it. So, right. and that is, I think, the biggest, you know, yeah. I, I hear it all the, the time. Well, well I'm going to wear a mask. It's not going to protect me. Well, you know, social well, responsibility. But if, if, and it can you. protect you a little bit. It can protect well, sure, you a sure, little bit. Sure. Because if you're wearing the mask and someone sneezes right near you, 
because you're breathing in, that's why you have to cover your nose and your mouth. And I always tell people, wearing a mask underneath your nose does not help you. You might as well not wear it at that point. Exactly. It's not helping. Right. It's got to cover your nose. So when you breathe in, if you happen to get one of those particles float by you, it will stick to the mask and not come in. And then it dries out and it dies, which is why you take the masks off from the side Right, instead of the, and let, let them, them hang, hang instead of grabbing them like this. You never want to touch the center of the mask. Right. You take it off from your ears. Perfect. Take it off from both ears, actually, if you're going to be perfect about it. And then you wash them regular. I always wear mine for a day and throw them out, or I have a bunch of paper ones. But I use, and I don't use any special masks unless I can, I'm doing one of those special procedures. Sure, sure. Thank you. That was Very awesome. Helpful. Um, okay, yeah. so, oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. No, it's okay. Yeah, I mean, it's just anything we can do to help people feel comfortable. And I get it. They're hot and they're uncomfortable and they're yeah. difficult to wear. Yeah. And I wear them all day when I'm at work with patients. And, you know, it is. It's difficult. And when I'm working with people that are hard to hear, it is really hard. Yes. Um, but what bugs me the most is people that take them off to talk on the phone in public. I'm oh, like, yes. listen, then just, okay, if you need to do that, then go outside, take your mask off. It's not and that's when people talk the loudest is when they're on the phone. So. Right, right. And then there you go. Yeah. yeah. Um, Okay, so next question. This is a long question, but the answer is hopefully shorter. Um, I don't know if you know. Do you know who uh, Larry Brilliant is? Yes. Okay. So he recently made a statement that I was watching in an interview on Wired. Um, his statement, it, quote, <laughs> it's not the variants we see now that scares me. It's the variants that will occur because the immunocompromised people who have been vaccinated won't have enough immune support to completely stave off the virus in their own body. This enables their body to create variants that can now escape the vaccine because it quickly learns what works and what doesn't and has all of the time in the world to do so within their body. You then have a superbug that once it escapes the immunocompromised person and spreads potentially escaping the vaccine and others. Wow. Oh, that's that's some that's some really cool science fiction. Okay, that's um, why I'm asking. So the best way I would the best way I would put that is if this theory that he is espousing that is a science fiction theory were actually true, then we would have super influenza bugs because a virus is a virus is a virus. It would have already done this. The second thing is is that all virus mutations are just random events that are accidents when a virus replicates. So it is that, true that vaccines are, generally speaking, dumb. And they're not alive anyway, So, but they are right. dumb. So realistically, uh, from what I've read, and you can verify this is true, it just, like you said, it's a chance occurrence, and it's not necessarily learning as a live right. Vaccines don't learn. And, and it's not like, so what he's trying to apply is what's called antimicrobial stewardship theory to viruses, which is the bacterial theory of, if I inappropriately give antibiotics to people who don't need them, I am selecting for bacteria in their body that are resistant to these antibiotics. Absolutely, that is a bacteria. Bacteria are alive, they're organisms, they breed and replicate. Right. Viruses are a protein. You can argue if they're a life form or not, um, but but they don't function in the same way. That would be like saying that I am a tiger. Um, you know, it, 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 and, and that's and it's even less similar than me being a tiger. It's more like I am a fern. Yes. Um, you know, that's how far apart those two are evolutionarily in terms of things. Good. So Good. you can't apply antimicrobial theory to viruses. It doesn't work like that. Good. They don't function and the same way. I appreciate you clear, answering that one. This virus. COVID Sorry. is a virus. Yeah. Trust Just me. It, it, oh, if it was if it was an antibody, if it was a bacteria, we'd have an answer for this. There would never have been a pandemic. Right. There hasn't been a bacterial pandemic since a bubonic plague outbreak. And those you just literally put up roadblocks around and then they don't go anywhere. Yeah. And then proof of that is Colorado had five cases so far this year and they're freaking out about that. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah. so it, it's, just, it's, it's just one of those things where they're just different and you can't apply the same um, evolutionarily evolutionary functions to a virus that you can to non-viral life forms. Gotcha. They're just different. Um, so logic. Yeah, it, 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 it's just like this great big scientific guess. I mean, what, I, what people get worried about is the actual science, which is the more replication the virus does, so the more people get infected and the more people get sick, the more chances there are that a random error will create a, a vaccine resistant virus. That's the concern. You know, a, an infinite supply of monkeys typing on a series of typewriters in an infinitely large room will eventually create Shakespeare. There you go. Yeah. Because um, it's a random event, it will happen. 
Nope. Um, the same, same idea, idea here with viruses. Okay. It's just random events. They're not. Well, that was a. That was a new one that I had not heard. Um, yeah. I, 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 well, I actually didn't add it to the list of questions I was going to ask you until last night. Um, <laughs> and only then because I heard it three times on yeah. social media. And that's when I you finally know. decided. And I didn't think it was real. I had to go actually research it and find it. And Wired has kind of buried the interview since. Um, yeah. It's kind of hard to find, but it is out there. But it was. Uh, yeah, that's, that's the, the problem, problem with social media, media unfortunately, yep. is that faux science, science travels super fast. fast. It is. And it's too bad that Wired didn't do their homework. <laughs> So that's another story we can have. Um, okay, so the last topic um, is the immune system. Uh, one of the questions we get asked by our clients the most is, what can I do to increase my immunity to help protect them, uh, myself? I, I, need, I need the typical answers we give, uh, vitamin D. Uh, vit- I guess vitamin D, from what I understand, vitamin D is a big one, but uh, vitamin D, just overall taking care of yourself. Mm-hmm. If you have uncontrolled diabetes, get it controlled. Right. If you have high blood pressure, get it controlled. Um, those kind of things um, are, are yeah, typically I mean, what we right. tell them. Am I on the right track there? You mean, you're right. 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 Get, get vaccinated. vaccinated. Okay. Well, of course, of course. I'm Pass sorry. That. Yes. Right? Pass that. that. Now, what, what do you do, do to have a healthy, healthy immune system? system. First, First one, one people, people forget, forget all the time, especially in Las Vegas, Vegas is being well hydrated. Good. Hydration is, the, is water is part of the engine for every cellular function that we have. Great and so if we're dehydrated, we don't do well. Second is actually sleep. Having good sleep patterns are restorative and allow your immune system time to kind of sort things out and help you do a lot better. So I always put those two first. Then I go into like dietary things, which is the healthier you eat, the healthier you are. That's just a basic fact of thing. (laughs) Yeah, kind of a make sense rule. But then when you get into, okay, so now what am I gonna do that's targeted here? What things may have made a difference? So. There's There's some some early data that vitamin D may be helpful. Um, We don't know 100% for sure, but we also know that most people are vitamin D deficient anyway, so it can't really hurt. So it may be just a causality that, hey, or a relationship, we don't know. It could be that vitamin D may be protective, or it may be just having low vitamin D in general just makes you sicker when you get sick. And it doesn't matter from what kind. So I always tell people, you know, having, um, you know, a a decent multivitamin intake is not a bad thing. Um, But too much of any vitamin can be toxic, so you got to be careful to usually use the recommended amount. Sure. And no more, because you can tox your liver or your kidney. And that will actually reduce your immune system. Absolutely. Um, So So those those are are big ones. ones. Um, And And then literally literally there's like like all kinds of things about different herbal supplements that may or may not help your immune system. The The problem problem is we can't get past relationship on any of them based on the data. So I always tell people, you know, if you want to take or do one of those, the best thing you can do is just talk to your doctor and say, I want to take this. Is this okay with my meds? Or you can go to your pharmacist. And a lot of times they can help you say, you know what, hey, listen, I know you love this herb, it sounds great to you, but it interacts with this prescription medication that you're on, and that's gonna make you unhealthy. So let's look for something different. So I think that's the next kind of thing you can do, but the, the two big ones, right, are stay hydrated and get good sleep. Well, as far as the hydration thing goes, I, um, I uh, several years back I had a personal trainer uh, explain to me that, uh, have you tried flushing a toilet without water? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it's very true, true, right? And so I'm going to be honest right there. It's mine. Always nearby. Um, I always have water with me in this town. And I think it's important for all of us to have access to that and make sure that we stay, you know, well hydrated because, again, it helps our immune system function and it functions better. The second thing is that it also helps keep our nasal membranes and our mucous membranes moist if we're well hydrated. Sure. And then we're there. You know, other things you can do is stay away from sick people, you know? Yes. And I think that's a very reasonable thing to do these days. You know, in this world, you know, I've talked about it in our own office at Silver Summit. is like, listen, if you feel like you have a cold, I don't want you to come in. I want you to work from home. If you don't feel, and in the old days, right, you know, in my day, you didn't stay home from work unless you were, as a doctor, unless you were dying, right? You needed to be intubated. Yes. You had to be put in a hospital. Or as you came to work now, we're like, no. Nah, I mean, I literally got a summer cold two weeks ago, and at the clinic said, listen, I, I don't know what's going to happen. I need 24 hours to get tested. Just convert all my patients into video visits. I'm going to have to do them as a video visit because I don't want to potentially expose them. And I came back negative, but good for me. But you know what? I just don't want to reduce those risks anymore. Safe and sorry. And I will tell you that I've learned from the doctors I've seen and the other clients I've talked to that have doctor visits that many doctors will 
allow you to either do the virtual video, virtual yeah. visits through video, mm -hmm. or phone, or um, they will let you wait in the parking lot and they will call yeah. you when, it, even yeah. now, when it's your turn. Yep. Not just because you're sick, but if you tell them that you have uh, a comorbidity yeah. or that you just no, don't no. feel comfortable. We've we've, we've, we've done, done that uniformly, uniformly and now. We're all literally even with my veterans, if they're like, listen, just call us that you've checked in. If you want to stay in your car in the parking lot, that's fine. It's great. As soon as we're ready to put you right in the room, we'll call you and you can come right in and go right up um, and, and no problem. Or if you prefer a video or a phone visit, we're more than happy to do that. That's one of the nice things. I always tell people there has to be something positive from the pandemic. And I think the one positive is that we've gotten better at telemedicine. And so I think that, and, it's, and right now we have parity, meaning, you know, if, if a, if a visit with a cardiologist is covered by your plan, so pick any of the silver summer plans is a good example, then a televisit by a cardiologist is covered the exact same way. And so you, know, you have the same benefit no matter how we deliver the service, as long as it's done with two modalities, with sight and sound. Yes, absolutely. Um, and it covers. If it's just a phone visit, we have phone visit codes for that. We should absolutely. Be but, one, but I think that's important. Absolutely. And one of the things that Rob and I have always, uh, since we really since we opened our agency back in 2014 slash 15 uh, was we made, we've made telemedicine a big part of what we do. And we have always yeah. touted it as one of the benefits that we offer. And even prior to Silver Summit coming into our market, um, we had other ways to get Teladoc delivered to our clients. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was a relief, honestly, when uh, Silver Summit came in and had Teladoc built in yeah. Uh, to their plan. And not only that, now uh, so many of the doctors are also providing telemedicine visits. So you have both options, right? Yeah. You, you get a service telemedicine and your individual provider can do it. I think we're going to see that stay with us. Good. And that's a good thing. You know, so I'll look for my one positive amongst all the negative. And trust me, it's not even close to being an even scale, but it's something. Um, sure. That we can focus sure. on as a good learning for this going forward. It, it is. It is. Um, that's all of my questions. Um, any, uh, Rob, did I miss anything? Anything that you? No, I, I can't think of anything. Um, I mean, I suppose we could go on and on about, you know, various statistics and myths and everything. Um, you know, one thing, you know, I, I'm sure you've done plenty of these interviews, Doc. I'm just going to turn the mic to you. What would you like to message to people? What's yeah, that was my next thing? question. Thanks. Thank you. Perfect. Oh, you know, the message honestly is, you know, from my heart as a person, I got vaccinated to protect my community. I asked my family to get vaccinated to protect their community and to protect others. Mm -hmm. and, and fundamentally, I understand there's political beliefs and there's fear and the, the health system may not have treated you fairly before, but this is really a public health issue for all of us to do for each other. This isn't about individual liberty or freedom or choice. This is about us stepping up and caring about our community and those around us. And unfortunately, it's the only way we can do it. Right. right. This, this is the only way we can do it. it. I, I wish I wish there was another way. And I, I wish that we could say, hey, listen, you know, you can choose not to be vaccinated and it's OK. I just need everybody to step up and do it so we can put this thing out and find the new normal. Otherwise, it's just the fear is we're going to continue to run around and have issues and, and problems. Well, I'm going to summarize it. I'm going to just summarize a couple of things, and Brian, you could edit this out if you want, but I, I, I think it, in summary, okay, th this is not mind control, the government's not tracking you, the election's over, COVID's still here, this is not about power and control, this is about preserving the human race, this is about people trying to take care of people and encourage people to take care of themselves in the quickest and healthiest way. It is not perfect. It is not perfect. But when you look at the facts, the science, this is the best way that we can help ourselves. And if you don't have a medical degree, please either get one or stop talking. <laughs> or talk to your doctor. <laughs> well, I just people ask the right questions, right? Go to a trusted source to get your information and try to get one that's not got a bias. I don't have a political bias here. I don't care, right? There'll always be elections. The government may be tracking you, but it's not doing it through vaccines. And you know what? We can't fix that. Right. It's going to happen. So what we need to do is understand what I can control. What I can control is the fact that I don't like wearing a mask when I'm when I'm out, outside indoors in public. I don't. It's, it's hot and it's uncomfortable. How am I going to make that go away? I'm going to get everybody vaccinated. So we stop spreading this. How am I going to do it so I can travel easily again? Because if you haven't flown 
since COVID, it's, it's not, not really fun to wear a mask for heard. airplane flight. Oh, God, it's a nightmare. It's not. That. It's hot. It's, it's uncomfortable. uncomfortable. If you, you thought know, you felt claustrophobic in a plane before, before try doing it when you're wearing a mask. Really right? Annoying. We have to move past these things and, and really get us back. And unfortunately, or fortunately, it's a relatively simple answer. And yes, I understand the healthcare system may not have treated you fairly in the past. I get it. This is not a healthcare system issue. I worked for the VA. We did the Tuskegee experiments on people. It was horrible and it was unexcusable and I get it. But this is not that. This is well-developed, good science here to try to help you and get you back to what you want to be doing. And that's what I'd like for you to do is get back and do what you'd like to do. We all want to. Mm-hmm. Yep. Great. But thanks that, for letting me chat. Oh, God, no. Thank you. Um, we really appreciate your time on this. I think that, awesome. you know, our clients ask these questions and we, we have the same feelings as you that you know, we want the information out there so that people just they know what to look for and uh, and what to talk to their doctors about. And I've encouraged my clients, look, if you don't trust your doctor, that's up to you. But go see a second doctor. Go see a third doctor. Yeah. Ask them the same questions. If, you, if all three of them give you the same answer. Better or not, chance they're right and you're not. <laughs> so, you know. <laughs> see a doctor, but see somebody who's qualified yep. to discuss yeah. this yeah. topic. Yep. And, and unfortunately, some doctors have not spread the most accurate information. And I, I'm sorry for that. I wish our profession, you know. Are you talking about frontline doctors? There are some, unfortunately, who have done that. Yeah. And, it's, you know, I, I get it and I haven't seen it. Well, you know, my job is to do this research. This is what I do. Yeah. You know, my job is to advocate for those members that are Silver Summit members, whether that's in, you know, our Medicaid plan or our Medicare Advantage plans or whatever it is, it doesn't matter. Right? My job is to advocate for you and make sure you get the right care sure. and to deal with those issues. And this is one where I'm like, I know clearly this is the right care. It will keep you out of the hospital. And that is a really good thing because the hospital is never fun. The food's not that good. The company's never that great. You never get to sleep. You never think about beeping the same way again. Exactly. We just want to keep you out. Well, and kudos for Silver Summit for putting a, a, a professional like yourself in the position that you're in uh, to create and manage these insurance policies on medicine, not financial stability. Yeah, well, you know, listen, this is free to everybody. We wanted to make sure they knew that it was free, right? There's no, there should be no financial barrier to this. And for sure. many people who need them, we can get them rides back and forth to get their vaccine if that's the barrier. Yep. We want to make sure that those things aren't there. You know, those social determinants have to be correct. The so, bottom line, go back yourself. There you go. There you go. Um, Dr. Murawski, thank you so much for your time. We oh, we appreciate this more than you know. Um, and uh, we, we are glad to have you as a resource. Thank oh. you for uh, doing this with us no today. Problem. We'll do it again sometime with something a little more fun. Sounds good. <laughs> do that. Thanks. Thank you so Take much. Care. Have a great day. You do the same. Bye-bye.